Welcome back to the Tom Anderson Show, the best company on your morning drive in Alaska on KBNT 1020 AM and 92.5 FM. Online at TomAndersonShow.com, 6 AM to 9 AM Alaska time. Want to join us? Call 907-357-5868. That's 357-5868. Good morning, America. Here's Tom Anderson. Well, or maybe not Tom Anderson. This is Brad Keithley uh, sitting in for Tom today while Tom takes a well-deserved break. Uh, I'll be sitting in for all three hours. In the first hour and in this segment, we're going to start talking with uh, Cody Rice, uh, an, uh, in, an interview conversation that I've been looking forward to for the last couple of days since we agreed to do it. Cody, how are you this morning? Hey, good morning, Brad. I'm doing well. Great. Uh, it's 6 a.m., so, you know... I, I'm not sure I'm doing well. I sort of pump up, you know, a little bit of coffee before I hit this, so uh, I'm trying. Cody is with uh, Wood McKenzie, as I described in the in the lead into this, uh, uh, one of the best, uh, uh, if not the best, uh, oil and gas consulting firm out there. Whenever you ask uh, somebody in the industry about uh, you know what somebody's thinking, if they say Wood Mac uh, says thus and so, uh, you perk up and you listen and you and you pay attention to it. So. Uh, Cody, it's great to have you. Great to have you with us this morning. T- tell us just a little bit about what Woodmac does, so people have that background as we get into the conversation. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Uh, so we're a global research and consulting group um, focused primarily on oil and gas, as well as mining. Um, now, some chemicals and renewables as well, but historically Wood Mackenzie's strength has been oil and gas, particularly upstream oil and gas. You have a unique background, I think, to, to have a conversation about uh, oil and gas issues and LNG issues from an Alaska perspective. Uh, you are an Alaskan, so tell us a little bit about your background so we can keep that in mind as we have the discussion. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I am an Alaskan. I was actually born in Valley Hospital years ago. Um, I grew up in Alaska. I went to the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I studied resource economics. I worked for the legislature um, all through the original tax changes from a gross tax under the economic limit factor to PPT to ACES uh, to the Alaska Gas Line Inducement Act. I worked for the Division of Oil and Gas for a while, as well as the Department of Revenue Tax Division, and then I went to work for BP Alaska, and then for Wood McKenzie for the last five years, three of that in Houston, and the last two in New York City. Well, that's certainly a complete background. I didn't realize you went all the way back to uh, to the beginning of uh, of L or to the end of ELF, maybe, and uh, in the beginning of ACES. That that certainly gives you a, a broad background in in the industry and how the industry, how we've, how we've taxed the industry and the fiscal structure uh, that we've taxed the industry. I want to, I want to talk mostly uh, today about LNG uh, because I think it's going to be, as I explained in the last segment, I think it's going to be an issue that comes up during this election cycle and certainly is an issue uh, that's talked about a lot uh, among Alaskans as we work through the process of whether we're going to be able to bring together uh, a project uh, or not. So why don't, why don't we start with, why don't you tell me a little bit about where you see uh, the global LNG market these days, just at a you know, 30,000-foot level, so we sort of get that basics down, th- those basics down. Yeah, so our LNG team had seen uh, LNG prices softening in the near term, uh, but the truth is uh, that we see the market, we see the market improving um, in the time range that the Alaska LNG project is likely to progress. Uh, We have a bit more conservative view on the timeline for that project than AGDC does. Uh, The Alaska Gas Line Development Corporation, I believe, uh, has talked about an in-service date in the range of 2024, 2025. We currently model around 2030 um, based on wanting to see a bit more alignment between the participants, et cetera, and just the challenges of getting a, a project at this scale off um, off the blocks. 
um, you said that Woodmac has a more um, uh, a positive outlook for the for the LNG market these days. What, what's been the what's been the the change that you've seen through the last uh, a couple of years, three years that have that sort of Im- have improved your view of of prices and of demand? Yeah, so right now demand is demand is growing, and a number of LNG projects that have been pretty speculative have come off have come off the table. So what we're looking at is, in order for an Alaska LNG project to be competitive, uh, it needs to have gas landed in Asia for around eight to nine dollars. Uh, destination. I, I think Wood McKenzie has said in the past uh, about $8. And I think that's consistent with some of the messaging that AGDC has done as well. And, and, and where's that, where's that demand coming from, uh, Cody? What's the, what's the demand side change that, uh, that you've seen that has, that has driven, uh, that is, is it regionally focused? Is it, is it mm-hmm. Asia, China, Korea, Taiwan, what what what's going on that's that's increasing the demand? Yeah, good good question. So Asia has historically been the largest center of demand for LNG. If you look at the major consumers countrywide, you're looking at Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. Historically, if you add in China, the percentage of the total LNG market that those countries represent ranges between 50 and 60 percent. Um, And the largest grower um, in recent terms has been China, with just last year China edging out South Korea um, for the largest import volumes uh, for second place after Japan. Um, There are other countries that are experiencing strong growth as well, India being one, um, and a handful of smaller consumers experiencing large percentage growth, but none with the scale that China is bringing. And do you see that demand in China continuing to grow uh, over over the near term, intermediate term, or do you see it sort of leveling out at some some point? We definitely see gas demand growing in China um, over the foreseeable future. There are some piped gas um, opportunities for China that we believe will be coming online around 2020 um, that may reduce the percentage dependence on LNG um, in the midterm, but gas demand in China will, will definitely remain strong for the foreseeable future under, under the baseline forecast we have. And, and the, piped, uh, the piped supply that you're talking about, is that largely coming from Russia? Yeah, I believe so, off the top of my head. I've seen articles in the last couple of days uh, as well, or the last couple of weeks actually, as well uh, as the sh- uh, as well about the shale potential in China and the opportunity, uh, the potential opportunity or the potential role that shale could play in China. I know in the past there have been there's been a lot of discussion about about shale about the shale potential in China, but there's also been big concerns about the water, uh, the availability of water to develop that. Shale takes a huge amount of water uh, to drive the fracking process necessary to break open shale and bring it bring it forth and I've and I've seen some discussion about uh, about uh, water issues continue uh, in the, in these recent articles about shale do you does does Woodmac have a have any sense of, of whether shale is is something that's going to break through in China and all of a sudden you know consume the Chinese market and take away the LNG opportunity yeah you nailed all the key points uh, around 2024. 2025 range in China, we expect that type gas or shale gas will take off uh, more than it has. Um, the constraint historically has been access to water. The, the areas in China where type gas or shale gas uh, is trying to be developed uh, has not had the water infrastructure that you have access to in the lower 48 onshore the U.S. Um, it's a dry area with, without the infrastructure in place to, to bring that um, to commerciality. We expect that that will change eventually. With that said, it's not going to take away the market completely. The, the analysis that we have in terms of pricing and demand uh, in 
incorporates an increase in, uh, in, in the commerciality from tight gas, shale gas. When we talk about, we'll talk about in detail about the Alaska LNG project uh, uh, next segment, but, but in this I sort of want to get one more sense about who our competitors are out there. Um, you know, Mozambique is developing uh, LNG. You have uh, a potential, some people say the potential for capacity increases out of uh, PNG, Papua New Guinea, and capacity increases out of Australia. Um, has Does Woodmac have a view about whether those could take take complete control of the market or whether there's a market opportunity beyond those? Yeah, so we have a cost of supply stack on a project-by-project basis, and, and we build up the demand on the same way. And, and the way that the curve looks now, as, as I said a couple minutes ago, is if you can deliver gas into Asia, specifically into Japan, for around $8, then in the 2025 range, then you can be competitive. If you're delivering in uh, the 2030 range, you may have a little more room, maybe 9 to $10. Um, but in the near term, the competitors that we're talking about are, as you said, Mozambique, Papua New Guinea, PG, um, West Coast Canada are the ones that are the most obvious geographic competitors, as well as uh, some Gulf Coast gas, uh, gas exporters. Cody, we'll, uh, we'll pick up with that when we, uh, when we come back. Uh, this is Brad Keithley talking to Cody Rice. I'm sitting in for Tom Anderson today. Uh, this is the Tom Anderson. We'll be back uh, after uh, the break. We've been talking to Cody Rice uh, from Wood McKenzie. Cody, for those of you who are on uh, the last segment, know that Cody has a, has a, uh, is unique in that he has a, a deep Alaska background, born in Alaska, went to UAF, worked in, Ala- worked in the legislature, Worked uh, for uh, in in the executive branch for the Department of Natural Resources. Worked for BP, and now is is a, a, an analyst with Wood McKenzie, uh, the finest. I'll, I'll even go out and say it, Cody. Cody, the finest uh, uh, oil and gas consulting firm in the world. Uh, we're talking about um, LNG, and and in this segment, I want to dive down into Alaska LNG uh, a little bit deeper, and I want to set it up with uh, with this from a recent piece that Tim Bradner wrote. Uh, in the Anchorage Daily News. Quote, there are still a lot of huge unknowns for the Alaska LNG project, not the least the splatter that might come from a trade war between the U.S. and China. But the fundamentals remain that China needs Alaska's gas if we can deliver it economically. That's still an unknown, and we now have a big new competitor, the big shell-led LNG export project in British Columbia. But despite our skepticism, the Alaska LNG project is the only thing we have that could really move the needle on our economy. It's our best shot, so we should do what we can to help it along. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that was Tim Bradner's, that's Tim Bradner's perspective. Uh, frankly, one I, I agree with. So Cody, let's dig down into the Alaska, uh, LNG project and try to try to figure out what's going on there. We, we talked about the opportunities in the last, uh, segment. We talked about China being an opportunity and we talked about, they're, they're being, you know, competitors for, uh, uh, for that uh, opportunity, both in terms of potential uh, Chinese production, t- in, in terms of pipe supply, as well as other LNG projects out there in the world. Let's talk a little bit about Alaska LNG's strengths and weaknesses. How do, how do you assess what, what, the, what the Alaska project brings in terms of unique strengths that would give it a competitive uh, opportunity and the weaknesses that might, uh, that might take away from that? Yeah, thanks, Brad. Uh, I, I tend to agree with with Tim on the LNG piece. Um, it's a massive project that has a lot of benefits for Alaska, and if if uh, the state and the producers can find a way to progress it, it'll make a big difference for the economy here. Um, with regard to competitors like LNG Canada, the, the analysis that we've done puts. LNG Canada in the same block or in the same boat as Alaska LNG in terms of delivered prices. The the government in Canada has recently made some tax changes 
to make it a bit more attractive for LNG Canada, but that looks like it only makes, uh, from our analysis, about a $0.10 cent per MMBTU difference. It's, it's not a big change for the project. Um, the, the biggest advantage that Alaska LNG has on a global scale is simply the size of the resource base. Um, back when we were talking about a piped gas scenario, we were, we were talking about four and a half to six BCF a day of gas. That's simply a massive amount of gas. Um, this is a bit smaller um, throughput, uh, roughly 3.3 BCF a day at the North Slope. But when you're talking about as many trillion cubic feet of gas as Alaska has discovered without, without having any gas-focused exploration, uh, that's a, a massive advantage. The, the other advantage is, is locationally. You don't have to go through the Panama Canal. Um, and you have pretty short shipping times to Asia. So that's uh, 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 that. That's certainly uh, the strengths of the Alaska project. How does that How does that match up against uh, Oh Mozambique and, and and expansion projects in Australia, or an expansion project in in PNG? What's what What's the what, What's the relative strength that Alaska has with those compared to those op- those alternatives? Yeah. So the relative strengths would would still be would still be the same in, in terms of diversity of supply, um, supply from a, a nation with a history of stability, rule of law, et cetera, and some locational advantages. But the, but the honest truth is, Brett, there's almost nowhere else in the world where LNG has a requirement of building a 800-mile pipeline to Tidewater. Most other LNG is essentially at Tidewater already or very close to. Um, in Canada, we've, we've seen projects where we're talking about a 400-mile pipeline. Um, but nowhere that I'm aware of globally is looking at an 800-mile pipeline to LNG. So that adds to the cost. The Arctic environment adds to the cost as, as well. You said in the last uh, in the last segment, uh, and I was intrigued by it. You said that Woodmac is is looking at Alaska being a player, Alaska LNG be, being a player, but perhaps on a different timeline than what uh, AGDC is looking at. Uh, you said that AGDC is focusing on 2024, which we hear a lot about in the state, but that Woodmac's looking more at the 2030 time frame. What's driving that uh, that difference? Yeah. It- Bluntly, from from our perspective, I, I think AGDC has done a great job to move the project forward, um, as have other folks in the state and and the upstream leaseholders themselves. However, there's still a lot of work to be done uh, from from a permitting perspective all the way through construction and there's uncertainty around a project of this scale and how quickly it can be delivered um, just just due to the scale and complexity but also due to issues of alignment um, you know not to get too far into the weeds but how is royalty and kind versus royalty and value going to be dealt with um, Conoco Phillips has from my understanding a marketing arrangement with AGDC but the other upstream producers do not um, so how are those issues going to be resolved will play a critical role in the timing or the delivery of the project. Some, some say that it, under any circumstance, Alaska LNG can't succeed and that we're wasting our time and we're wasting money pursuing it. Um, and, that they, and, and if it does succeed, they say the only way it can succeed is by the state accepting a submarket or subsidizing the price. What do you think about what do you think about those arguments? Are there is there no success case uh, without uh, subsidization by the state? No, I, I think the case that's been put forward currently um, could could work. To be to be really honest, I, I was fairly skeptical of the possibility of LNG in Alaska after having worked on a pipe gas scenario back in approximately 2007. It's just it's a very big project to get off the ground with, as I said, a, a very long, very expensive pipeline from an Arctic environment. 
Um, but having sat down with uh, some of the producers uh, as well as AGDC over the last two years myself, um, I'm considerably more optimistic that this is a project that could go forward. That I mean, it also depends on what your definition of subsidies are. So the tolling arrangement would create a requirement for a somewhat lower rate of return um, than might be required if the upstream operators themselves were operating that segment of the project. Um, is, is that a subsidy? Not, not really. It's uh, under, under our view, it still generates a rate of return uh, around 7 to 8 percent. That's well above the state's cost of capital. Um, well, that's that's a that's a that's a good view, a, a more positive view. I'm a little surprised at the at the 2030 time frame. I agree, this is a huge project to get off the ground. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time. But but in the ne- if, if we had more time, the next question I would ask would be: Are there ways of shortening that time frame, bringing it back more toward the 2024 uh, schedule? We will delay that. We will defer that to a discussion at a at a future date, though, Cody. Thank you so much. Uh, for taking the time to talk with us this morning. Yeah, thank you. Uh, It's been a pleasure. It's Brad Keithley sitting in for Tom Anderson today. We've had Cody Rice, who's an analyst with Wood McKenzie. LNG has a strong Alaska background. Talking about the LNG project, we will have that discussion and others up on a podcast uh, uh, later this week. Uh, and, uh, and, And those of you who missed it or want to dig into it can listen to it again further.